gentrification, you can't necessarily stop it. It's going to happen. And it's good if you live over there. So if I live over there and I'm in a $80,000 house and now my value doubles or triples, goes up to $160,000, $240,000, I'm loving it. My mm -hmm. property tax is going to go up. Mm -hmm. Now someone else who decides to sell today, not completely knowing or having knowledge of what's about to take place, they may be disappointed five years from now when they see all of what's going to happen because they're not able to connect the dots. Hey, and welcome to another episode of Strategic Moves. I'm your host, Ken Dowell, and today we're going to continue talking to some more of our brothers around town to talk about issues that are affecting our community and what we can do to try to work together and build a stronger community. So we're going to do our little part, and our little part is to continue the conversation, and we're going to keep that conversation going right now with none other than my good friend, Julius Cartwright. <laughs> Welcome. 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 All right. Everybody who don't know Mr. Cartwright, I met Julius Cartwright years and years ago doing real estate. And he's been around in our community selling real estate and doing all kinds of entrepreneurial type businesses over the years. And he's going to share with us some of his things that he's got going. And we're going to talk about how we can work together and any tips that he has to help us try to help each other out and try to help our brothers out. So without further ado, Car right. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us everything what you got going over there? Sure thing. First and foremost, I'm excited to be here with Strategic Moves and to be invited to the podcast. I saw your your initial podcast and it was outstanding, very well put together, very professional. I said, "Wow, he's got to get me on there one day." Oh no, no doubt. No doubt. I've been <laughs> begging the, to get you on. And today's that day. So <clears throat> I thank you. My background, as you know. I got licensed at 22, but I've been in the mm. game for 34 years. So mm. that's a piece on the subject matter of entrepreneurship. We know everybody's not going to go to college, mm -hmm. uh, not going to go to military per se. Mm -hmm. uh, most people want to start their own business. And people don't really realize getting your real estate license as an agent, you are a real estate entrepreneur technically, mm -hmm. that you are an entrepreneur, and it's an easy way to get inspired. I mean, mm -hmm. I basically... You can get licensed at the age of 18. Right. I got a young man that's coming on board who's 17, and he's going to be taking the classes, so he's going to be licensed at 18. Mm -hmm. I have another young man that got licensed at 19. Okay. So if I can have someone under my tutelage at 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, mm -hmm. and put them on a career path 15, 20 years, they can basically sit down if they follow the blueprint. Mm -hmm. So the sky's the limit in real estate as it relates to sales, investing, buying rental properties, et cetera. That's a key way that you don't need a lot of money, a lot of capital to get going. And you certainly don't need to have a lot of experience it's in terms of running a business because mm -hmm. your infrastructure is under the brokerage. And that would be our brokerage. And my brokerage is Dream Team Realty. We started off as a team in 1994 yeah, as one that. of real estate's most recognized real estate teams. I think we were like the second or third team out. Mm -hmm. And then it evolved six years later when we bought our brokerage out, mm -hmm. W. Jones and Associates in 2000. So mm -hmm. we're 22 years strong. Mm -hmm. And we've been handling everything from bank foreclosure properties, the first time home buyers to working in communities, selling new construction, land acquisition, so we've done the whole gamut and working with real estate investors across the, the United States and the world. So for the folks out there who don't know, what's the difference between a broker and an agent? Why don't you tell us? Sure. Each sales agent has to come under a broker because mm -hmm. you can't get your license. There are basically four classes you have to take. Mm -hmm. After you take those classes, you have to have a broker sponsor you. And then you apply with the division of real estate, sit down and take your test. After you've been in the business for two years and it's a total, I think, about 30 transactions mm -hmm. that are verifiable with the division of real estate, that person can become a broker. But every agent has to work under a specific brokerage. Mm. And how long you been a broker, you say? I became a broker six years after I got licensed. So it was 28 years mm -hmm. as a broker. And so then I started my brokerage another six years after that. Mm -hmm. So did you grow up here in Cleveland? I sure did. So where you grow up at? Very good. 93rd and Kinsman. I grew up on uh, Eastern yeah. Avenue. So you grew up on the South Side. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So, so what high school? Went to uh, Audubon Junior High, then got bus to Charles A. Mooney, and I went to John Adams. So I'm a rebel. 
Oh, yeah. You're real. You know what? I didn't have so many Glenville folks here. You one of the very few that escaped outside of the hood, man. Yeah, so yeah. Well, in, well yeah. Glenville. They, you know, <laughs> we had we had the number one track football, basketball. Uh-huh. I mean, lately, Gin has done a phenomenal job yeah. with them. Mm-hmm. So I can't say anything about Glenville. They've been doing well, but Adams is on the rebound. And so you you were doing that most of your transactions. You've been doing a lot of real estate here in Cleveland. Yes. So you you one of the folks who do a lot of inner city would you say or oh absolutely yeah absolutely. So, so talk to me about the market and what's going on in our inner city i did an episode with india lee and mm-hmm. we talked about gentrification and and that kind of thing fact, i was talking with um my daughter i guess mm-hmm. i could say now because she's working with you and she's an agent yes. and she talked about a property over on lee road and i was doing some canvassing with one of these candidates this summer and we was walking down lee road so i knew exactly what she was talking about when she said it, because yes. when I walked down there, I looked, I said, what the heck? You know, so those houses over there, Lee Road, they were $400,000. Well, it, Lee Avenue. Lee Avenue so, yeah. so, because I don't want people to confuse exactly. Lee it's Road, the right. one that goes from Lee miles Avenue all the way off 105 near Ashton. To Euclid, right. Yeah. So, so the deal is this for many years, things have been taking place on the west side. Mm-hmm. And the west side is great. You know, your Tremont, Ohio City, Detroit Shoreway. Mm-hmm. That's a stone throw from downtown. So those areas are just blossoming and they're built out. So now the play is coming to the east side. Mm-hmm. And to me personally, being an east sider, I mean, I, I got self-proclaimed rights to say that the one pocket that they refer to, it's actually Glenville. They call it Circle North, mm-hmm. 44106. And that's mm-hmm. from 105 and Way Park to Superior, mm-hmm. back o- across Lakeview, back down Way Park. That is about $400 million of development that's either up or in the process or plans to be done. Mm-hmm. And so that's mind boggling for the average person that lives over there because this neighborhood is changing Mm -hmm. and it's being gentrified and Mm -hmm. gentrification. You can't necessarily stop it. It's going to happen. And it's good if you live over there. So if I live over there and I'm in a $80,000 house and now my value doubles or triples goes up to 160, 240, I'm loving it. My -hmm. property tax is going to go up. Mm -hmm. Now someone else who decides to sell today, not completely knowing or having knowledge of what's about to take place they may be disappointed five years from now when they see all of what's going to happen because they're not able to connect the dots unless you connect it to your councilman, and that's Councilman Conwell's ward over there. But it's not only happening there. Mm-hmm. You you know, they'll start on 105 with the VA Fisher House and then the mixed-use mm-hmm. piece that they got, which that's $27 million. And when I saw that, the light bulb came on because mm-hmm. I'm well-traveled being a past Mm-hmm. national president of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, mm-hmm. NARAB, African-American Real Estate Trade Association. I've seen and witnessed this in about 100 cities. So mm-hmm. I can drive through a neighborhood and tell you what's going to happen in a matter of half an hour to an hour after I've had an opportunity to take inventory of what's going on now, what the plans are, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a movement from 105 in Quincy mm-hmm. to 105 in Cedar which really is connected to the Opportunity Corridor. Right. And uh, you see IBM medical records on the corner of 105. You got people in there making $125,000 a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and across the street from that, they're building a Myers. Not only is it 40,000 square foot grocery store, but it's 161 units over the top of it. Mm-hmm. So now that's right across the street from Cleveland Clinic. It makes sense. And then there's Innovation Square, some apartment buildings. There's a half a billion dollars worth of development right in that strip. Mm -hmm. And I would gather to say that 90 percent of the people who live in those communities are totally unaware of it. Unless they've been involved with city council and the nonprofits and they've been at the table to attend meetings, then they know what's coming. But the average person that drives through there that lives in Cleveland, they don't know because you don't have to go that way Mm -hmm. until it's time to go to the hospital or to visit somebody, and then you see it. But if you're not going that way, you don't see the changes every day. So you said half a million dollars on Half a billion. No, I'm talking about what the houses cost over there. We're talking $400,000. Yeah, yeah. so the houses that we're selling are about three... They start about three thirty-five mm-hmm. to about as high as four, mm-hmm. but there have been some townhouses that, and there's another builder involved who sold some townhouses upwards of four fifty, and it's working its way to a half a million dollars over in that really? market. Yeah, 
And the same thing in Fairfax. You got properties selling over there now, mm -hmm. new bills for about three fifty five to three eighty five. Mm -hmm. And so these are about fifteen, sixteen hundred square foot houses. And mm -hmm. so all that's taking place. Now the incentive is you're looking at the price, but you have to look at a few other factors. Mm -hmm. now, I was gonna get to that because I'm a hundred percent sure the city <laughs> kicked in everything that they could well, to make this well, possible. Well, if I'm gonna buy in a suburb and I might be paying an additional four to six hundred dollars a month in property taxes and I can buy in the city and only thing I'm paying is fifty dollars for my land because I get a fifteen year tax abatement and then you get twenty thousand dollars down payment assistance and a forgivable grant, mm -hmm. that's probably a $600 swing in payments for the same house. Mm -hmm. So there's an incentive for me to be there. Now, the mm -hmm. X factor is the school system, obviously, whether I got private school, I'm an empty nester, et cetera. That's the key thing well, that, well, that, that people are comparing it to. Why well, I don't want to move in there. And then some people say, well, I'm not safe. I see what they're doing. Right. But that's still Lee Avenue. It's still Lee Avenue. Yeah, it's still, still 105. And my, my only thing with that, though, is after these tax abatements are up and people then either try to sell these properties or move out before the abatement's up so that the next person come, that's the issue that sometimes travel with these type of projects. And then you end up with property that are still there that the next man can't afford to buy. And you end up with what we had before when we had all of these houses that's underwater and people were just buying houses. Well, I think this would be different. So first thing is first, we advise the people to pay that extra $150 to $300 a month toward mm -hmm. the principal. So in 15 years, your house should be paid for. Mm -hmm. Should be. Take out the 30 years so you keep the payments low, mm -hmm. but pay extra so you reduce the principal. By doing it this way, the goal and objective is for your house to be free and clear. So now when they reassess your property mm -hmm. 15 years from now, it's going to be assessed at a higher number. Like those ones that the Famico Foundation did on 105, those big gigantic duplexes mm -hmm. that they converted into singles, those taxes, one just came on the market, a property tax is about $9,000, $10,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So they're anywhere from $800 to $900 a month. Now, if you are just paying your mortgage regularly and you get hit with that, it's going to be a problem. So it's the same way down the Euclid Corridor with all of the townhouses, those 15 year tax abatements have, have long since been up and they reassessed it. So the people still have a high payment. Mm -hmm. So you have to take advantage of the tax abatement and put that extra money that you're saving. Everybody's not going to do it, but you at least educate them and hope that they'll do it. So they're not in, not in a tough position. But the other thing is, I don't think that this particular neighborhood and all of this infrastructure is ever going to stop because See, University Circle is the third highest economic engine and employer in the state of Ohio. That little block. University Circle. Not, not, I'm not talking about Circle North. I'm talking about University Circle where Cleveland Clinic, Case, Severance mm -hmm. Hall, all, that, that, they have more jobs. Mm -hmm. That economy is so strong mm -hmm. that it is now pushing up into an area that people are going to be shocked is in East Cleveland. Because mm -hmm. now the project is pushing up in East Cleveland mm -hmm. on those first five or six streets. And right. They're going to be building some houses over there, a couple hundred homes mm -hmm. so and townhomes. So when that kicks in, it's an expansion. Because what happens, the circle gets larger mm -hmm. and larger and larger. It starts off like a golf ball, mm -hmm. and it goes into a softball, then a volleyball. So the area just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. And because of the wealth and the income, of the people who are buying, it's not going to be like it was before because K students are expanding north mm -hmm. in terms of renting units. They're mm -hmm. renting houses as low as five or six hundred dollars a student, mm -hmm. and they got a new bill over there that they're renting at fourteen hundred dollars or one bedrooms that they're renting for eleven $1 hundred dollars. So mm -hmm. the student rental after the first two years they don't want to be on campus it's not enough housing to accommodate them mm -hmm. so they're starting to expand and then several of them see the value mm -hmm. they're buying one of the kids that we just sold a house to is back at case to get his phd and he moved back here from phoenix okay and he's interested in buying a house because he's know he's going to be working on his phd for the next six years and he doesn't know what he's going to do after that but at least he's got a house a couple of college students staying with him mm -hmm help offset his expenses and in six to ten years he may sell the property interesting and that's a different philosophy so 
people need to try to understand the gentrification. There are ramifications for people in the neighborhood. If you and I own a house on the street and they're putting all this infill development, building new houses, our property tax is eventually going to go up and increase. If we're on a fixed income or something like that, we may be have some issues. Or if we're a senior, we may be able to go on homestead and keep Just our taxes right. the same and right. we can maintain. But if that's not the case, property taxes will go up. But they should because the area in the neighborhood's improving. That mm-hmm. area is patrolled by five different police forces, mm-hmm. DA, Cleveland Clinic, UH, uh, yeah, Case Police, and all that. So they, they're they, on they're top in the of area, that. but nobody's patrolling. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, well, I don't know. I mean, they, 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 nobody's patrolling. They ride through yeah, there quite yeah, often, yeah, so they make sure that they, they keep the They just ride through there, that's yeah. for sure. I use my show as a platform just to tell it like it is. I've been part of the process for a long time. Mm-hmm. I done helped a lot of people, and I done took up for a lot of folks. But, yeah. man, the last 20 years or so, man, I sit back and wonder, you know, a lot about what did we truly get accomplished. Right. And, and, and I'm not going to sit here and say, yes, we got five police force that's trolling Lee Avenue because we don't. Right. You don't. You barely have one police force that does that barely at this point. And, and the numbers show that. So, but that ain't, you ain't on here to talk safety. We're here to talk entrepreneurship. So okay. I want to go back on entrepreneurship. Okay, we we'll go back. But, but I do go have ahead. one comment to that. Okay. okay. So the mixed use piece that the Finch Group built, right? Mm-hmm. 63 units. Mm-hmm. 80% of them are college students. Mm-hmm. They walk from 105 up Lee Avenue or up Ashbury, mm-hmm. and they have not had any incidents. They're rolling because those kids that are in there don't look like you and I that are going to case and who are staying there, and they got a waiting list because mm-hmm. they're 100% occupied. Mm-hmm. So they're keeping it grounded. It's a funny thing. Our people don't bother people at other persuasion. Me and you walking at night, it might be an issue. That the fact that, like you say, as case students, they write, they really write their by case. And majority yeah. of the crime that we're talking about, even in our community, doesn't happen with us walking there neither. Right. You see what I mean? So I, I for the most part, I think we're safe. Uh, occasionally, your drive-bys and the craziness that goes yeah. on in our community. It's just straight up crazy. But for the most part, at home and that kind of thing, I think people are safe. And, and even with the college thing, you know, my son went down to Morehouse and Kennedy was at Central and other places that when we went on the college campuses, they always told you right off the rip, man, we got you but as long as you on the campus. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, they That's tell true. you that. We That's got true. you That's as true. long as you on this campus. But as soon as you step foot off the campus, all we can do is give you things that you should do to protect yourself. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I think that that's important. But I wanted to talk to you more about this entrepreneurship and being sure. a young man in this society. We talked about everybody don't go to college and don't want to go to college or may not do a trade. Let's talk about some of the secret sauces about being an entrepreneur and going into well, that sure. kind of thing. Sure. I, I, I think that more people should look at entrepreneurship mm-hmm. as an opportunity, but I think they need to make sure that they have, I refer to as your personal board of directors, okay. meaning that these are your mentors and people who can guide you. Mm-hmm. So in most cases, we don't have the infrastructure, mm-hmm. great ideas, great concepts, great philosophies, great strategies, but if they can't be executed on the right level, we cannot succeed in entrepreneurship. So you got to have your personal mm-hmm. board of directors and you got to have your mentor. And basically that's your team, mm-hmm. the people that you're going to be working with, a banker, attorney, a mm-hmm. good accountant, a lawyer, a good business person like yourself in general. And then they got to understand how politics weighs into what they may be doing as well. Mm-hmm. Some people don't think about that and say, I don't want to get into politics. But the moment you say that, you're already involved in politics because mm-hmm. the political aspect of what happens could impact you depending on what kind of business that you're in. Mm-hmm. And Cleveland is a city that I think if you can make it here, you mm-hmm. can pretty much make it anywhere mm-hmm. because it is a hard nut to crack. I mean, you come up with a good idea, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a food truck, staying in the same food industry, whether it's selling clothes or boutique, you know, or some kind of tech or Mm -hmm. business piece, that would be great. So what we do, one of the many things that we do with the equity movement, 
which is a financial wellness program that we have. Mm -hmm. And we have 15 resources. Two of them really come into play with business. Mm -hmm. One is evolving entrepreneurs because those are people who are evolving and looking to get an entrepreneurship. And we try to focus on young people, making sure that we can put our arms around them and build them up in that space. Mm -hmm. The other is a small business development because even myself, even though I'm in business, I don't profess to know everything. I certainly don't know everything and I can still learn, right? Mm -hmm. I still have to have a high teachability index where I can learn something from somebody. Mm -hmm. So I have to continue to go to seminars and workshops to mm -hmm. sharpen my tools and educate myself so that I can be a better businessman because there's always things that you can learn and mm -hmm. there's a time to go get money and a time not to go get money. Mm -hmm. uh, a time to put together your personal friends and families when you're setting up business mm -hmm. and opening up your company to go borrow and then thinking about the strategy of paying those individuals back. And I wish more businesses would look at SBA loans to buy real estate in their format, because if they would look at that as a model, like I example, I had friends uh, maybe 20 years ago they wanted to buy a car lot. It was off of miles mm -hmm. and they, they bought it. These guys bought it cash and they had a car wash. I ended up selling it to a guy that ended up putting a car lot on there, but he went and got an SBA loan. Mm. So he bought the real estate and he brought his business that he already owned to that footprint. Mm. And so oftentimes we look at leasing and sometimes if your lease mm -hmm. amount or rental amount is going to be the same as your mortgage, and you have guys like me and you in there with a small office mm -hmm. offsetting some of the expenses, it might make sense to buy that property. And then you can have some income coming in. So if business tapers or dips, you don't have to rely solely on the business. You could rely on the tenants. Mm -hmm. And then if you can cover the note anyway, if it's a thousand dollars, if me and you are paying three to 500 each, it's just a bonus if they get an extra 600 to a thousand dollars in rent. So that's an aspect I wish that more entrepreneurs we we'll really look at. And then we have some great entrepreneurs around the city that are doing things. And we have to learn how to network mm -hmm. with other visionaries, with other like-minded individuals that we can manifest what we're doing. Well, you know, that was the thing I was talking to uh, my daughter about was that um, as crazy as it is right now, the age that you are at 2021, 20, you have to go to all of these networking events and you're going to see all these people. And she said, a lot of my folks don't have money. I said, today. Mm -hmm. I said, that, that's today. Right. I said, I remember when I was 21. I remember looking for a house at 22, 23 years old. But I also still remember Carol Joyner. I still know yes. Cartwright. I yes. still know Brenda Williamson, yes. who every time I ever picked up the phone and said, hey, I wanted a house. I need something. They always was there to give me that information. Yes. And yes. then when the time came that I got ready to buy a house, that's I went to one of them. So I said, the relationships you're building now with these mm -hmm. people, I mean, they're your peers. So you will hope that in five, six, seven years from now, 10 years from now that, yeah, this guy you've been sitting in this networking with all this time then actually really did go out and get a real job. <laughs> he has a family and they want to buy a house. Yes. And so yes. it may take you five to 10 years to even just build up the network of folks. It's not a bad thing. I told you just the way that you have to work. So I do believe networking is the key to all of this stuff. But I wanted to ask you a question for that entrepreneur, that young guy who got an idea that he believes is good, but everybody else think is bad and you're not going to do it. What'd you say to him? And he said, I'm going to do this business, man. This is what I want to do. How do you deal with that? Right now, the way society is set up now with internet and social media and everything, everybody is pushing entrepreneurship. And everybody's pushing, hey, you can sell this, you can sell food, you can do this, you can do that. All of these various different types of business out there, but everybody's not a business person. It's true. And everybody don't understand business the way they should understand business. Um, I dealt with a young lady not too long ago and asked her to do something for us. And she quite didn't do exactly what we wanted her to do as it relates to the business. So, how do you deal with the young entrepreneur? So what I would say to them, number one, I, I, I wouldn't want to say anything that would demolish their dreams or mm -hmm. taint their ideas or mm -hmm. their creativity. Mm -hmm. But I would just ask them to be open to the conversation. First thing first, know what you don't know. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So if I'm not good at bookkeeping or managing money, I have to confess up to that. I may be good at one aspect of mm-hmm. the business, which is marketing mm-hmm. or sales, but I may be suspect in other areas. Oftentimes you can look to partner with somebody. You have right. a strength that I don't mm-hmm. when one plus one makes two and then together we can make some stuff happen mm-hmm. because I don't have the skill set alone to be able to mm-hmm. pull things off. Sometimes we can't check our egos at the door. And I don't want to partner with you because it's all about me and I'm the CEO and I'm the president, but, and I want to maintain hundred percent of my company, but hundred percent of zero is still zero. Mm-hmm. So I would rather partner with two people or four people or collaborate with them in some sort or come together and put together a business mm-hmm. and have 25% of a, you so know, $10 million dollar company than to, right. to try to do it on my own. Exactly. And I got a $50,000 company. I'm just a glorified sole proprietor. I'm really right. not a mm-hmm. entity because I don't know how to set up my structure and I don't right. have an actual team. And we got all these individuals doing these individual things. And oftentimes we don't really come together to mm-hmm. try to collaborate. And then the other thing is you can look at things that can kind of offshoot what you're already doing. So in my case, my background being real estate, after the Equity Movement magazine, which has been out for three years, we produced this magazine called House Notes, mm. which is a quarterly magazine that we distribute in Cleveland electronically. Mm-hmm. And we distribute to about 250 locations per quarter. And it's easy for me to do this because I'm already in real estate. And the subject matter is real estate made wise or house notes, quarterly magazine. Mm-hmm. I can cover stories on topics like mortgage decorating. I'm, I'm still in my wheelhouse because I'm still dealing with real estate. I'm still dealing with what I do best. And then since I got publishing experience from doing this book, the equity movement, mm-hmm. I got experience in that. So again, I'm able to expand into entrepreneurship, which is different businesses as opposed to doing one business. And it's hard to do one business well, much less two, three or whatever. So the spinoffs are a possibility if you can get that first one off the ground mm-hmm. and then you can build that team around you because then you can learn how to expand in some different areas. O- over your years of dealing with real estate and, and by you doing a lot of work, I'm sure you have ran into a lot of our street brothers and sisters out there that's entrepreneurs oh, yeah. that's trying to do your thing. And a lot of them, you ran in, you have a lot of good success stories with some of them who might have started out and you know what, man, these people really got their stuff together. Oh yeah, yeah, several guys have, have started off and I've said, if, hey, if you're going down that road, you know, it's a temporary, mm-hmm. uh, there's a temporary possibility of you having a long-term strategy and succeeding. You need to legitimize what you're doing and cross over. And several of them have done well in stuff like real estate, others have opened up different businesses and so forth, and they've been very successful in actually pulling it together. So, yeah, it's been real helpful. And I'm looking for an idea of when you have these guys and you're getting ready to get into real estate in that regards, even though you have cash, still having all of the necessary other pieces you need, the credit and everything else is more essential as well as being able to put together a bona fide organization as well. You want to speak a little bit to that? Well, you know what a friend of mine said to me, he said he would rather have credit than cash because Mm -hmm. if he's got credit and relationships to be able to borrow money, he'll never be broke. He'll always have cash. So, If you got cash and the credit is bad, there's no reason that there's no correlation there. Mm -hmm. There's no way you should have $50,000 that you're working with and your credit is bad, Mm -hmm. you know, unless there's some extenuating circumstance. But typically you can correct that credit because you're going to need to sign your name and credit is leverage and leverage is speed. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes real estate attractive because a person buys a property with 3% down and they can buy a half a million dollar property or whatever the case may be with a little bit of money and they've leveraged their credit to be able to take down that asset and be able to allow that asset to grow and expand from that. So that's one good thing that you can do with the cash versus credit. And then the other thing is I've seen different people open up, going open up clothing stores, antiques and mm-hmm. restaurants And uh, several of them have done uh, research companies and graphic design marketing companies and doing things that are significant 
in the entrepreneur space mm -hmm. when they really focus down on to long term. That's what they want to do. And it's a powerful thing mm -hmm. if you can create from your idea what starts between these ears. Mm -hmm. And it is all now it's all paying the bills. It's mm -hmm. paying me. Mm -hmm. It's paying for my living and rent. It's oh, paying yeah. for my oh, yeah. family. Oh, yeah. And it's all my original. Nobody's telling you, mm -hmm. Ken, I need you to be here at, at nine. Mm -hmm. You leave at five and you're worth fourteen dollars an hour or twenty dollars an hour. The sky's the limit, you know. Yeah. So that's the thing about entrepreneurship. You control your own destiny. Now everybody can't do it because if I'm married and I got kids, mm -hmm. I can't venture out there because I need that base income to mm -hmm. raise my family. Mm -hmm. That's the beautiful thing about reaching at these evolving entrepreneurs, catching them between the ages of 18 to 25 and getting them to take a chance. Because mm -hmm. now at that age, you haven't started a family. In most cases, you may not be married. So you can take a risk. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't mm -hmm. work out, mm -hmm. you can recover. Right. But it's hard to take that risk at 35 to 45 oh, when yeah. you got a family. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Wifey's kicking you out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, and the bills are uh, Unless you're just a serious, serious hustler. And when I say hustler, that doesn't necessarily mean you're selling drugs or anything. I mean, right. you just hustling. Yeah, you grind. And I grind. I did that for a long time. Shit, I only had one or two real jobs in my life. You know, mm -hmm. I, and if I did only had them for about a year or so, I think the longest job I had was working in the recorder's office. I think I worked there for about six, seven years. Wow. And then after that, I left there. I basically was working for myself, but I have been an entrepreneur working, hustling, man, selling anything I can to make a dollar. Mm -hmm. All my life, put all the kids to school that way. And, you know, and we talk about it because we, what we share in common was our boys playing football yes. together. Yes. And we used to go to the Mark Harris lessons and you guys had me taking Anthony all over the place trying to teach that boy how to throw a damn football. <laughs> and, man, I was telling Anthony as we got older, I was taking him to see this guy, Tom Art. You remember Tom Art? Yeah. Tom Art, he ended up being the coach over at John Carroll. John Carroll. He was yeah. the head coach of John Carroll for a little while. Then now he's coach at Akron. Okay. He's Akron coach, head coach. But he was teaching Anthony. I think I was paying this dude 150 almost $200 an hour to teach wow. Anthony how to throw a football, man. We was going to see this dude, man, at least. I think we was going to see him, I think, twice a week. I mean, twice a month. No less than two or three times a month, man, squeezing in any time I could get him back in and get him back in. Doing that shit, man, and I'm telling you, I don't even know how I paid for that, man. I, you know, find to this day, way. just find a way. And all those things with Mark and all of those things, and we were going around all those camps and all that bus stuff, man, bus stuff, tours yeah. and stuff, man. I didn't have no regular gig, you know. And so anything I was doing, the wife was taking care of the house with her job she had. But, man, it's that, you know, that, yes. that spirit of wanting to try to really – do where you want to go and be who you want to be, I think is the key, man. And I'm hoping that this new generation of folks we got have it and they just don't blow it all on just thinking, hey, I can do anything and don't open up the doors of trying to get out into other avenues that maybe you think you're a baker, but maybe you should try doing something else while you baking. If that's truly what you want to do, you'll come back to it. You know, but who am I to say that? Because hell, I did what I had to do to survive myself. So, well, the beautiful thing about this young generation, they're creative when it comes to technology, when it mm -hmm. comes to creating apps mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and coming up with ideas for music or whatever the case may be. They're very, very creative. What guys like you and I have to do is nurture that creativity mm -hmm. and we have to put on forms. And we probably should do as part of your entrepreneurship series. We should probably do some outreach sessions where we can reach out to some of these mm -hmm. younger entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and see how we can nurture and guide them along with mm -hmm. stuff like a business plan, mm -hmm. access to capital, venture capitalists to put some money behind mm -hmm. what they're doing. And we may even be able to formulate a group of people that may pool some dollars together that it will help mm -hmm. let them decide, you know, almost like, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't use legally, can't use the Shark Tank concept in terms of the name, but something similar to that where somebody will fund mm -hmm. for maybe a piece of the action. Sure. You know, we could do something like that mm -hmm. as an innovative way to mm -hmm. 
help some of these entrepreneurs mm -hmm. rise to the level. I they think they to. tried to do that once before up here. So I think Reese was doing something. Yeah, I yeah, he mind. might have been. But there might be something to revisit. I mean, just on a small no, scale, no. you don't you, have to you, do you, it. On we, you, 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 even if he did, you can still do it. Sure. I mean, it's Absolutely. not like we're doing it so much that we can say, oh, we don't want to do that again. Exactly. <laughs> and it's a whole new set of entrepreneurs coming exactly. through the pipeline now. So what you got to say to that young entrepreneur, that guy who's out there trying to do it, you, you know, Mr. Cartwright, from your experience, you got anything you got for that young entrepreneur? I would say keep the dream alive, stay focused. Mm -hmm. And one of my quotes that I have in my book that's coming out is most dreamers are constantly dreaming while most entrepreneurs are consistently performing. Ooh, say that one Most again. dreamers are constantly <laughs> dreaming while most entrepreneurs are consistently performing. And it's okay to dream. I'm mm -hmm. a dreamer. Mm -hmm. I ain't too many people dream as much as I do right. about stuff. But dreaming without performing mm -hmm. is just dreaming. Mm -hmm. You got to perform. The entrepreneurs perform. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. They take the risk. They devise a plan. Mm -hmm. And they get behind what their vision mm -hmm. and their aspirations are. And they pursue it with a lot of passion and a lot of drive in whatever aspect that is. So... That's the key. Hey, man, I appreciate you coming on our show. We're going to sure. definitely be diving into more entrepreneur conversation. If you got any questions for Julius Cartwright as it relates to real estate or entrepreneurship or anything along those lines, please leave it in the comments below, and we will make sure we get those questions answered for you. Also, there will be links in our description where you can be able to get more information about Dream Team Real Estate Realty, as well as some of the other projects that Mr. Cartwright is working on. But right now, Mr. Cartwright, we're going to let you have this camera. It belongs to you, man. You can sit there sure. and say whatever you want as long as you want. Thank you very much. I would uh, encourage you guys to go join the Equity Movement at EquityMovement247.com. That's EquityMovement247.com. Go there. Join the movement. The movement is absolutely free. We make our money with our partners and our collaborative people that we work with. And the movement is focused on four generations, Gen Z, Millennials, Generation X, and Baby Boomers. And we're showing the way to financial awareness and wellness. So make sure you go to Equity Movement 247. And if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking to grow an entrepreneur space, sign up for Evolving Entrepreneurs or check the box for business development and we'll help you excel in those areas and work with you with our partners appreciate being here all right thanks again talk to you later